Good day, Jeff. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Oh, Guy, thank you. I'm really excited to uh, get a chance to talk to you in person, to be here, and I'm also really excited to be part of this series. I don't really um, belong here, but um, uh, it's a great series, and, and, and I'd like to personally thank you for, for putting all the work and putting this together, because I think people find this really useful. I know I do. I don't have time to watch all of them, but I, I it's on my to-do list constantly to try to catch up. So thanks a lot. I'm excited to be well, here. Well, there's 106 of them right now, so you know if you're ever... Uh uh, sick or something, and you have nothing better to do. Um, uh, I'll keep for, it in mind with the coronavirus. Thank <laughs> you for that. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you grew up and where you went to college and uh, what you studied? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Jeff Dalto. Uh, I, I don't exactly know my title. I work for a company called uh, Vector Solutions, but I'm in that instructional design and human performance niche. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I went to Michigan State University. I studied English literature there, with, uh, and that was in the 80s. So I had the requisite dollops of uh, kind of deconstructionist critical theory, religious studies, philosophy, and, and classical studies. Mostly played a lot of basketball and listened to a lot of music. Um, moved off to Seattle in 89, and, and that's where I started my career. And that's ultimately how I wound up doing what I'm doing today. Ah. So uh, where do you live right now? And tell us a little bit more about the work that you do. Yeah, I, I work right outside of Portland, Oregon. I'm sorry, I live right outside of Portland, Oregon in a small little town called uh, Camas, Washington, directly across the Columbia River. Uh, as I mentioned, I work for a company called Vector Solutions and kind of a company they bought called Convergence Training. And, and I try to uh, help customers use evidence-based methods, even be aware of them, use them, uh, both for training and, and human performance improvement. And um, one of the things I get to do as part of that is I do webinars like this. I, I interview some of the people you and I both know. Uh, I've done recently with uh, Dr. Patty Shank, Dr. Will Talheimer. Um, you're on my to-do list, so I'll be back with you soon. I speak at conferences. Um, in particular, I've kind of fallen into a weird niche uh, with safety. So I speak with a lot of people in occupational safety trying to bring oh, evidence-based training methods to them, which is sometimes uh, new and foreign to them. And also I work in, in safety with some people who are in a parallel uh, field or track to human performance improvement. Um, and sometimes they call it human performance improvement over there. Sometimes they call it HOP or safety differently or safety two or new safety. So that's kind of an overview uh, of what I do. Well, very cool. The reason I wanted to talk to you and the reason that you do belong in this series is because of the safety orientation. Now, the goal of my series here was to portray the diversity of HPT practitioners and their practices. And so, you know, not many people work in the safety domain, if you will. And so that's, I, I hope to uh, share with others you know, what that's like and the fact that there maybe is an opportunity for others to work in a, in a similar uh, area. Mm -hmm. But uh, before we go on to the other uh, questions, can you share with us some of the more interesting things that you've worked on in your career? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, so moving to Seattle with that English Lit degree, I found myself highly unmarketable and I had no idea how to get a job. So, um, you know, I did a lot of kind of manual labor stuff. I worked in a salmon packing place. I was a roofer. Uh, I worked uh, in landscaping. Uh, I did some other stuff similar to that. Um, and, and then ultimately fr from there, I kind of lucked into a, a job with an educational multimedia producer. They were mostly making old laser discs with like images of, of like for science education. So it's like a paramecium and you would scan a barcode and, and then read the book to read uh, fascinating things about paramecia, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but they also had this weird little thing going on in the back with these science-based uh, mystery skits. And, and I wound up with, with those people, ultimately. From there, I worked with a uh, startup called Apex Learning. It was a Paul Allen-funded company. And it was, originally, they were doing um, advanced placement courses for high school kids. So... Uh, economics and, and things like that. Um, I work at a biotech uh, lab where they made proteins, uh, creating training material and procedures and the like. 
I helped create a, a cur curriculum for an all woman surf camp. Um, and then more recently, I guess I've been working in manufacturing training and, and safety training for 10 or 15 years. Um, that's probably the, the general career arc there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, mm -hmm. or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or HPI, human performance improvement? Uh, where, how did you come across this? Yeah, I call it HPI. So uh, if I use that term, that's what I mean, human performance improvement. And I think my introduction, I'm pretty confident it was uh, Bob Mager, and it was the Mager six-pack. And in particular, if I recall correctly, it was the book Analyzing Performance Problems with the uh, kind of amazing flow chart there at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I think that was my beginning in, in the HPI world. Before that, I was, you know, kind of an e-learning designer. Um, so so and that, I've come back to that later in the career, like, hey, maybe I should be doing something other than designing e-learning. But also, initially, I, I wouldn't say I was the world's uh, most evidence-informed e-learning designer either, right? So the next book that, that comes to mind for me is uh, Dr. Ruth Colvin Clark's book, Evidence-Based Training Practices. So those two kind of uh, uh, set me on the right path. I am really start following uh, Clark's book about how to create training using evidence-based practices initially more than Bob Mager's HPI non-training interventions um, as a result of following through uh, on Clark's path, if you will. You know, pretty quickly I'm running into Patty Shank, even though I don't know it's Patty Shank yet because it's a book on how to use articulate. But I remember thinking this book is better than the average book, you know. And then um, Connie Malamud, who's kind of my hero, Kathy Moore, um, probably a little bit longer till I run into Dr. Will Talheimer. So, so those are those are the start for me. And then I follow, I think, a common progression that a lot of people have in the last couple of years where I start noticing or thinking more about, you know, improving not just uh, learning design, but, you know, performance and, and non-training interventions. And, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you when I started thinking more about that and everyone kind of was talking about it. Um, for me, kind of a, a critical turning point was an Australian guy named Aaron Pradhan, who focused a lot on uh, performance improvement in it uh, beyond just, you know, creating an e-learning course. And, and ultimately, you know, guy, that's how I wound up, like, finding you, um, which I don't remember the day that happened or the circumstances that happened, but you were a guy who was, a, you know, connected to people like Dr. Patty Shank and Will Talheimer and you were talking about human performance improvement. And uh, that's when I started following you. And you probably know I started peppering you with questions about it. And then um, along that way, like I said, I, I've kind of run into this parallel field uh, in safety, occupational safety, where a lot of the human performance improvement, you know, tenants are used in uh, improving performance in safety. And uh, again, that's new safety, safety two, safety differently in hop. And you know, there's a couple of big gurus there. Um, my intro is actually a guy named Ron Gant. I'm highly indebted to him. And in America, there's a guy named uh, Dr. Todd Conklin, uh, Dr. Cindy Decker in Australia, and uh, Dr. Eric Hallnagel are some big names. And we'll be uh, at the American Society of Safety Professionals Conference this year. Ron Gant and I, after the conference, hosting a uh, Safety Differently book club, the first ever. So we hope to be introducing, you know, things like, HPI to a broader safety audience over beers at a hotel soon in Orlando, Florida. Yes, I, uh, I my remembrances of uh, early going going to conferences. The best learning always happened at the end of the day in the hotel bar. That's where you would uh, learn the most uh, because that's where the uh, gurus would congregate and take exception to each other's work and uh, challenge each other. And it was uh, very insightful. But uh, so my next question, which you've answered, I think, to a large extent, which was some of your biggest influences, uh, people or articles or books. And so you've mentioned a couple books, but what, re regardless of whether they focus in on safety or just improvement in general, um, are there other things that you might help us point our audience to? Yeah, well, again, I would uh, 
I, maybe if I have to repeat myself a little bit, and I apologize. Uh, I would go back to that Mager six pack. I would definitely check out the works of um, Dr. Ruth Colvin Clark. That evidence based training practices book was great. But I, I like her book on e-learning and the science of design. Um, there's a really good book on technical training and, and another great one um, on visuals in training, which, which brings up Connie Malamet, right? Uh, I like both of her books on visual and training. Uh, it's also a handsome coffee book, uh, coffee table book. Uh, one person I did forget to mention, and this is early for me and, and really eye-opening, is Julie Dirksen and, and how great her book is. And... Um, it's super accessible. Uh, I love the, the ha apparently hand-drawn pictures. Um, she did a great job on that. And volume two is out. I am, it's, I'm halfway through it. It's on my bedside table. So uh, I definitely recommend Julie Dirksen. You know, Kathy Moore, I think I forgot to mention. Um, Patty Shank has three or four books. And I just, uh, she asked me to audit her online course on how to write uh, learning assessments. She's got another on learning objectives. Both of those are, are worth checking out. Everything Dr. Will Talheimer does is worth checking out. Um, again, I'm a big fan of, of Aaron Pradhan and his Learn to Learn app and other work he's doing. And um, I'm sure I'm omitting uh, lots of people as well. And as you know, I'm going back, I'm kind of digging uh, back uh, into the older kind of classic HPI books as well. Um, so talk to me in a year. I'll tell you what I like most about those. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do. Now, I normally set this up by saying, OK, you're at a neighborhood party. Um, there's a new neighbor and they come up to you and say, Jeff, what do you do? What's your short and succinct uh, uh, response? I try to do things to help people perform better at work. Very good. And if they say, well, what does that mean? Well, then I say that might involve training. It might help. Uh, it might involve helping them uh, understand the, the, the systems that they work in better to see how the systems themselves can be improved. And, and it generally involves some kind of facilitation of learning. Thank you for that example. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us uh, uh, what your current focus or next focus is? I mean, you're, you're looking at uh, Julie Dirksen's uh, uh, latest book, but uh, um, is there a theme about what you're looking at? And, and, uh, are you, and, can, and also, I know that you do write, so can you share with us, you know, maybe both things, what you're focused on in learning and what you're writing about? Sure, right. I uh, yeah, I do a lot of writing, like you say, uh, uh, at a blog and, and create webinars and speak at conferences. And the company we work for is focused on uh, industrial and manufacturing training. So, uh, and I'm not an expert in all of that. I think that's one of the things that caught our mutual attention about each other is we tend to write sometimes about things like quality or, or as you say to me, about safety. But I always have a lot more to learn. We're working a lot more lately with people in, in maintenance and maintainability and reliability. I'm an expert on none of that. So for my, my, my job, I, I try to learn that kind of stuff better. Um, in terms of things that I, I'm, and then, you know, we talked about my interest in, in safety and how I've kind of, I'm, you know, I'm not a safety professional, but the, the, the new safety crowd, if you will, has kind of like been very polite and kind and, and taken me as a, like a, in as a fellow traveler. So I'm always trying to keep up with, with them. So um, I think probably the next thing I want to start digging in on is deeper in the books of Eric Hollenagel. Um, but I recommend you know, people like Sidney Decker and Ty Conklin, the people out there who are totally unfamiliar with this idea. And you know we do write about it at the Convergence Training blog. We interview a lot of those people. We get a lot of good access. Probably I'm pretty, I'm pretty proud of that. Um, that and, and it's cool that how open and, and they've been and uh, all that. The, in terms of like bigger picture issues, well, I told you I'm trying to learn more about HPI, and I really would like to learn more about systems thinking and um, how to use not just um, how, how to how to be not just aware of, of systems ideas, but, but how to actually make it actionable. Just being told to like take a, a you know a big picture view um, or be holistic is is not always uh, super actionable. So I would love to, like, you know, if anybody has any ideas about that, please uh, forward them my way. And I guess the uh, other thing that's 
not yet queued up on the bedside table, but I, I'm excited to, to um, buy soon and read is, uh, and help me if I mispronounce the name, is uh, Miriam Nealon's new book uh, about evidence. I think she calls it evidence informed training. So that's kind of the, the big ball of wax I'm working on. Excellent. Thank you. And you did get her name right. Um, I, and it's a great book. I've just finished it uh, a couple weeks ago. Let's shift gears here a little bit. Uh, language is an issue in our field. We have a lot of uh, competing terms, uh, old terms, newer terms, uh, new spins on them and all that. But So my question is, is there a favorite, or perhaps it's not a favorite, uh, performance improvement term or phrase that you will define for us because perhaps you feel that it's being misused or misconstrued? But what do you have in that regard? Yeah, well, I guess to kind of set that up, I understand a lot of the work a lot of people do in, 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 in debunking uh, non-evidence-based practice and, and kind of uh, using social media to do that and, and quibbling over this term or that term. But, but I do think sometimes it, it could become unnecessarily either uh, negative or just straight up unhelpful and, and maybe even push people away. So uh, with that caveat, um, I don't really think I'm an expert on any of these, you know, exactly what term X is or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, I think an interesting term at a super, you know, it's not super uh, esoteric. It's just this idea of in, engaging or engagement. Um, and I, I obviously, you know, like, I think that's a term that's misused by many people and kind of maybe uh, intentionally misused by people in marketing, right? But uh, uh as I understand it, just engagement means the learner is willing to do some work to learn it. And, and there are things as a learning designer you can do to make somebody more willing to put in that effort. But, but um, you know, engaging doesn't necessarily mean it was super duper fun. Um, I really liked it. And, you know, like, you know, the super fun or I liked it thing brings to mind Will Talheimer's books on like smile sheets and, and all that. So I, I guess I would just ask people to remember that uh, engagement doesn't mean I had a really good time, it was fun, but it means I was willing to put in some work in order to learn, because oftentimes learning is kind of hard. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for that. The next question has to do with stories that you might tell of others. Now, I'm, I'm looking for funny stories or serious stories, but uh, we can humanize people or perhaps you want to do a shout out to people that uh, you've worked with or for and acknowledge them. Um, we talked about this before we hit the record button, so I know that you have some people that you want to talk about, so please do. All right. If I remember correctly, I would like to, uh, so I am in Seattle, Washington, long hair, flannel, moved there for just in time for grunge and I was ready to go already felt completely unemployable, and suddenly I were, end up at this uh, educational laser disc place answering the one hundred sales number um, on a, uh, you know, temp basis. I think it's like a month, you know. And I'm in a uh, copy room, like doing somebody's copying work, and I mentioned that there was a weird little subunit in the back that used to make these kind of uh, zany, skit-based, problem-solving science mysteries for school kids. So I'm in that copy room, and I'm wearing a T-shirt of this uh, esoteric 1960s and 70s avant-garde jazz band called Sun Ra and the Orchestra. And one of the guys who's involved in making those skits in the back is actually an outside contractor. I never met him before. He comes into the copy room as well, and he is the only other person in the building who's ever heard of Sun Ra and the Orchestra. And, you know, that's how I got out of sales and moved into, produ into production. And that's how I wound up in this field is that random accident of Sun Ra and, and meeting Mark Lutwack in the copy room. So, you know, that may be arguably funny or interesting, but I would like to tip my hat to uh, Mark for, uh, you know, having the faith in me. And maybe they were a little desperate for a warm body as well, but, you know, I could spell and write. And then um, his wife, Y York, who uh, was wrote a lot of those mystery based things. And then the science educator there, Sean Taylor. And I don't know if any of them were necessarily like reading the same evidence-based people I just talked about, but they had a good grounding in evidence-based training or, or education. 
and that really served me well. Um, after that, you know, I was lucky, like many of us are probably, to work with a lot of good people who kept moving me forward here and there and, and here and there. And then, you know, like the kind of people I've been, I, I mentioned as, uh, oh, I started following them. They've been, over my career, they've been amazingly uh, open and receptive to, like, including you, to having, like, a stranger just, you know, start peppering them with questions. They always share their information generously, either, like, you know, because they wrote a great new article or because they'll answer your tweet. Um, and many of them have been kind enough to, like, come, come and be interviewed by me. Um, I do that partly to teach, you know, the people who follow me and our, our customers, right? But I, I learn... Uh, from, from each of them. Uh, so those have always been great experiences for me. And then, you know, the same thing, the, the, the new safety crowd uh, had always been exceptionally open and generous with their time and knowledge with me as well. So uh, shout out to all those people. Thank you. Jeff, uh, thanks so much for agreeing to participate with me in this video interview. As kind of a wrap up here, uh, my final question is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially the people that are new to the field, whether they're younger or middle-aged or older, but what guidance would you share with them? Yeah, well, you know, you asked me to be on this on this series, and I was like, I don't really belong in that series. He's, he's talking to like a lot of the like heavyweights and, and like all-time classics, you know? And I said like, well, but I, I am interested in it, and I do it a little bit, and um I think it's important for people to realize that it's okay to like start somewhere and, and start making progress, right? So um, I would encourage folks uh, to, you know, start and, and start learning a little bit about evidence-based training and human performance improvement and start getting, you know, a little bit better over time. And none of us will get perfect at it over time. And then uh, in, along the same lines or, or it, to complement that, um, and I'm going to steal this from, uh, I think, a part past words or final words that R and Pradhan uh, gave to me in one of our interviews for people is, you know, be kind to yourself and know it's okay if you're, you're, you don't know everything, if you're not doing everything perfectly, but if you're making forward progress and working hard at it, that's, that's great. And so continue that, be kind to yourself and uh, keep going. Well, thank you, Jeff. Those are, uh, th that's good advice. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights about all things performance improvement wise. Well, thank you, Guy, and uh, thanks to everybody I mentioned, and, and keep it up, and I'll be trying to interview you soon. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye.